author of the book of Mark cites two key references in their scene between Herod and their John. They cite Esther and they cite Daniel. In citing Esther, they word for word match to the half of my kingdom, to the half of the kingdom will it be given to you. This is a key reference because it's pointing to the one for whom these words were initially or ultimately met or meant for, which is Haman. Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Haman, next to the king, again, being enemy of the Jews. Again, in that same scene, author of the book of Mark is citing Daniel. The king wrongly sentenced Daniel to death. For the sake of his own oath, he would not go back on his word and he felt wrong because he understood that he was sentencing somebody just to death. And he spent the night in sorrow and anxiety. This same scene, this same sentiment between a king and one next to them is the one that the author of the book of Mark places into their narrative because they want, hearing these things, their reader to connect, or should I say the audience for whom this is meant, to connect their John to one next to and beloved of a royal throne. And not simply one that is beloved of, one who is a chief or prime priest, because that's what Daniel was. Daniel was chief and prime priest to the king. There, John, author of the book of Mark, using these references, they want their reader to know that their John is a royal character connected to a royal throne who is also a chief or prime priest of that throne. This is literary, and it's absolutely fascinating. They're doing this for a reason. And to emphasize that, they go back to their clothing. The man is dressed in camel's hair. This isn't what we would assume to be hairy. This is fabric. And in the Bible, man is dressed in camel's hair. This John is dressed in camel's hair. Camels are associated to wealth. This is a John that is not the traditional scope as we're used to thinking and believing. That's not the idea. This John is actually dressed very well. He is deeply connected to the state and deeply connected to the deep state, both politically and religiously, as we will see in this episode. And we want to focus on what this mission was for this John. At this time, we want to focus on what this mission was for this John. Now, looking at 1 and 6. Mark 1 and verse 6. Mark 1 and verse 6. John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. We looked at the camel's hair. We get the backdrop of this character due to the references the author of the book of Mark uses. We do not need to question the backdrop. Author lets us know the background without telling us the background. The mission was, this John's mission was, it wasn't preaching, although that's part of it. The initial mission is to eat locusts and wild honey. This John ate locusts and wild honey. Now, is this literal? If the scene between Herod and John is filled with references from the past. Letting us know that that scene, although there and although constructed in the book of Mark by the author writing it, taking references from the past, this should allow us to know that what we are reading is not actual fact of matter. Did it happen in that sort of way? Maybe. The references let us know, the references take us back to let us know that they are not writing something in actuality. They are writing something figuratively with the source, with the source of fact in it, but it is figurative. What we are reading, what we are reading, forget that this is 50 some odd years off the fact of when this document is printed and released. What we are reading is actually not literal. This is a stream of thought put together by streams of thought 
held together by the fabric of many, 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 many manuscripts. And what is here being written is not literal. There is a point to everything that is here as we're seeing and as we saw from them placing into their scene of Herod and John references from the past. Everything has a connotation. Everything has a connotation that leads to a concrete and sure understanding. John did not literally eat locusts. John did not literally eat locusts and wild honey. We can know this from how the author of the book of Mark describes, from how the author of the book of Mark describes the backdrop of this character, placing them into the category of Daniel and Haman. Them referencing those scenes allows us to understand the type of person we're dealing with and the type of person we're dealing with that is also dressed well. Camel's hair is well, that's luxury. This isn't somebody wild and untamed or such, as we would imagine. Somebody dressed like that and in that sort of fashion, they will not be literally eating locust and wild honey. But what in the Bible did eat locust and wild honey? What did? Because the same thing that happened within the scriptures of the eating of the locusts, that's what this John is reproducing. We will see. So what in the Bible ate locusts? What does it mean to eat locusts? Looking in the book of Exodus chapter 10, 18 and 19, Exodus 10, 18 and 19, he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord and the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Egypt. Locusts were not literally eaten. Locusts were taken away in this same sense. The locusts of the land, the locusts of the land are what John is sent to devour. Now, what do locusts do? Exodus 10, 14 and 15. Exodus 10, 14 and 15. The locusts went up over all the land of Egypt, rested in all the coasts of Egypt, very grievous were they. Before them, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be, shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. They did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, and there remained not any green thing in the trees. For in the herbs of the field, or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. The locusts in the book of Mark are a figurative representation of something. This isn't literal. <laughs> it's not literal. Locusts in the book of Mark, they are representing a land darkening agent. They are representing a plague, not plague as in sickness, a plague as in land darkening agent, a plague as in land darkening pestilence. It is this John's mission to devour or eat or consume the land darkening plague, the land darkening pestilence. That's what these locusts represent and that's what this John's mission is. This John's mission is to consume the locusts that are plaguing the land. So question, what are these locusts? What is this land darkening pestilence? Second Chronicles 6, 27 and 28, just to branch out, just to allow the Bible to help us to branch out. Second Chronicles 6, 27 and 28, Then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk, and send rain upon thy land, which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance. If there, if there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting, or mildew, or locusts, or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever so, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, and then it continues. The idea here in this verse is to show that the locusts are connected to, along with everything else there, blasting, pestilence, mildew, 
caterpillars. And all of these things put together, the author writing the Chronicles lets us to know that these represent the enemies of Israel. When we're seeing locusts, they represent the enemy of Israel. Locusts are also caterpillars. Locusts, maybe not naturally, figuratively, philosophically, they represent the same thing. So if we can understand what these locusts are, to now understand that what these caterpillars are, we can have a better understanding of what was this John's diet. We are to have, as is said and believed when it comes to life and religion, faith. But when it comes to exercising faith, a very crucial aspect of having and exercising faith isn't mentioned. In order to have faith in anything, we need to know what we would have faith in. This book looks into how the Bible defines the process of justification. We are supposed to know what we believe. Personal knowledge will bring life to our experience with the Bible. Get justification to know how to safely take care of your faith. Now, it's no secret that throughout the Bible, locusts are linked to caterpillars. They're one and the same, maybe not naturally, as you may see them in nature, but Bible uses them figuratively as representing the same tribe, the same host, the same mind, spirit, and assembly. Looking in the book of Joel 1, 3, and 4, Joel chapter 1, 3, and 4, tell you your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. All of these things mean the same thing. All of these things mean the same thing. Maybe not biologically or naturally, figuratively and philosophically. They mean the same thing. Looking in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 33, 3 and 4. Isaiah 33, 3 and 4. At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. And your spoils shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running to and fro of the locust shall he run upon them. Again, Bible is making associations. Same act, same deed, same spirit, same scene. Only difference is the names are exchanged. They are one and the same. Locusts are caterpillars. To the Bible's mind. This is figurative. This is philosophical. Looking at Psalm 105, 33 to 35. Psalm 105, 33 to 35. He smote their vines also and their fig trees and break the trees of their coasts. He spake and locusts came and caterpillars and that without number. And he did eat and did eat up all the herbs of their land and devoured the fruit of their ground. Again, association, same text, same context, same caterpillars, locusts, they're one and the same. Exodus doesn't tell us caterpillars were sent. Psalmist does. They're one and the same. Now, what are caterpillars? What is the underlying definition that we should be seeing caterpillars as? We get what they are naturally. That's not what the Bible's talking about. We're seeing what they are philosophically in a sense, but it may not be that clear. What are caterpillars ultimately? Jeremiah 51, 13 and 14. Jeremiah 51, 13 and 14. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, thine end is come, and the measure of thy covetousness. The Lord of hosts hath sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. Now we can get it. <laughs> now we can see that the ultimate definition of caterpillars which is also the ultimate definition of locusts, are men, are hosts, are assemblies, are people, not necessarily people walking around like on the street. This is people designated category, category, assembly, category, host. 
the locusts that were eaten by that John were not literal locusts. They were a host, a host, an assembly of men. Men to the Bible doesn't mean literal biological men only. To the Bible's mind, men means priests. Men means priests in Bible terminology. John is to consume locusts. In reality, John is to consume an assembly, a host of priests. And not just an assembly and host of priests. John is to consume a land darkening assembly or host of priests. This host, this assembly, they are a pestilence. John is sent to deal with the pestilence. To deal with the pestilence. The west wind in the book of Exodus took away the locusts. So we can know that the way that these locusts in the book of Mark are eaten and are consumed, that they are by a west wind. But what is a west wind? Not by his literal mouth is this John devouring or eating locusts. The literal nature of such is not what the author of the book of Mark is concerned with. We know this because they're taking scenes and reproducing them. They're casting all literality. They're casting all actuality out the window. They're using references and tactics to build up a backdrop that their audience should understand. Their John, intimately connected to a royal throne, being chief and chief and slash or prime priest of that throne, dressed delicately and real favorably, is sent to eat, to consume, to devour locusts. His mission is to eat locusts, not literal locusts. This is a land devouring plague. This land devouring plague pestilence, this is an assembly or a host that is bothering the land. They're bothering the land. So if in the book of Exodus a west wind, if in the book of Exodus a west wind took away the locust, we have to understand and know and trust that a west wind is what this John is using to take away the locusts. The eating is not literal. The eating is by a west wind wind. So what is this west wind? What is first of all wind to the Bible? John 8, 1 and 2. John 8, 1 and 2 reads, Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long wilt thou speak these things, and how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? When we're hearing wind to the Bible's mind, this isn't literal wind. West wind in this context, this isn't literal wind. Wind equals words. Wind equals words. Ephesians 4 and verse 14. Ephesians 4 and verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Wind is Doctrine in plain and simple terms. Wind is doctrine in plain and simple terms. The locusts are taken away by a west wind. In context, the locusts are taken away, eaten by this John, and consumed by a west doctrine. What does West, quote unquote West, what should it mean to the Bible? We know what wind is. Wind means doctrine. What does West mean to the Bible? How should we look at this? Looking in the book of Daniel 8, 4, and 5, this is automatic. Daniel 8, 4, and 5, I saw a ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. He did according to his will and became great. As I was considering, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, touched not the ground. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. The west 
is connected to this, this goat. The West is connected to this goat. Who or what is this goat? Same author writing Daniel 8 gives us the answer. We don't have to guess. Daniel 8, 20 and 21, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. This first king, we, we know that this is the kingdom of Alexander the Great. That first horn, that first notable horn is Alexander the Great. Eventually that first notable horn will be broken and four will come up. The west wind, the west wind is a west doctrine or a western doctrine crafted from out of the center, out of the Grecian kingdom. The west wind is a Grecian wind. The west wind is a Grecian doctrine, a Grecian doctrine arising up from out of the center of its first king there is no there is no better answer there is no better doctrine from the west that will arise that will be as universal and as powerful and as great from out of the center of that first king and the center of that first king is alexandria there is no greater West wind. There is no greater Grecian doctrine rising up from out of the center of this first king, from out of the center of Alexandria, than Serapis Christos. A Fallen Record, The Christian Transgression, is a book bringing history and the Bible together. We all want to know how the Christian religion began. But does the Bible show error occurring in the early church? This book looks at the origin of the Christian movement, and in a way where philosophical context is shown from the Bible. Learn Christian history from the narrative given by the Bible, and learn how the Bible shows the Christian religion taking another path. In a Fallen Record, The Christian Transgression This Grecian Doctrine This Grecian Doctrine is the wild honey that this John consumed. What is honey to the Bible? Psalm 119, only because I've gone, gone through and given plenty of illustrations in, of what honey is and have done episodes and lectures on them. Psalm 119, 102 to 104. Psalm 119, 102 to 104, this one verse should, should be fine. I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. A Western doctrine is what John preached, or a Western Grecian precept is what John preached. John preached a Western Grecian precept from out of the core of the West which West is connected to that he goat, which he goat is the kingdom of Alexander the Great. From out of the kingdom of the West, a wind should arise. This wind that should arise, its heart is at the heart of that first king in Alexandria, which heart is Serapis Christos. Serapis Christos. We have to remember that at the time that the book of Mark is written, Serapis Christos is Christ. At the time when we imagine a Jesus to be living, Serapis Christos is Christ and has been for the last 300 years. I'm not speaking of in 2024. My context is in the time in which we imagine a Jesus to be living. Serapis Christos, born in Egypt, heart of Alexandria, where his temple and religion is, is Christ. 
a west wind a west wind is used to take away locusts the west wind the wind being doctrine the west being grecian the kingdom of grecia a specific grecian doctrine is used by this john to take away a land darkening host and assembly that's the point of all of that written there we can't get caught up in what is written as if it's literal because it's not this is not a literal document we are reading first of all historical fiction ultimately fiction fiction religious religious with an agenda both politically and theologically we have to remember that when we are reading these things, when we are going through, and specifically the book of Mark, which is the, the core basis for the rest of the Matthews and the Johns out there, we have to remember that there is a figurative tone, both over and under, that the author is using. Literal locusts are not the focus of this John. A land devouring assembly is what this John hired, hired by the throne that he is deeply connected to, is to preach, to take away. Through the preaching of the west wind, this John is to take away the assembly plaguing the land. And this John, this John, highlighting that one is mightier than him and that one must put their hope in one, mightier than him, He's putting out a belief there, and while doing so through the west wind, mixing the two, the belief in the hope of that one, he's mixing the belief in the hope of that one with the western wind, with Serapis Christos, and he's putting forth a preaching, combining the two. He's doing this, this John is doing this to combat to go against, to counter-attack the prevailing plague of an assembly whose belief is destroying to that John's throne and to that John's community, the land of the Jews. He is hired to take away this assembly by a west wind. Only the west wind eats locusts, that's the point. Only the west wind devours locusts. This isn't a literal devouring that this John is doing. He's doing so through a doctrine of the Western world. How can we know this? Acts 18, 24 and 25. Acts 18, 24 and 25. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Why is it that only the baptism of John was known in Alexandria? Nothing else. Nothing else. The baptism of John was famous in Alexandria. There is an underlying connection here that the authors writing these things are keeping out from their audience but that they know. There is a lot that is kept out and that is mishandled and misappropriated in these documents that we might rely on, but we, we should not. Alexandria is the seat for the doctrine of this John because that's the west wind that his doctrine comes from. The doctrine of John is the application of Serapis Christos to the individual figure dash hope that he wants to highlight to his audience. Within his hope, the one mightier than him is Serapis Christos. This John is using a preaching, combining the West Wind along with the Jewish scriptures, the scriptures of that time, to create a doctrine to take away the locusts plaguing 
the land. This is the author of the book of Mark. By doing so, and by writing in the way that they do, they're letting us know that they're writing about a period that is not what we assume. They are writing about a period that is not what we assume. If John is taking this and the author of the Book of Mark is writing in the way that they are writing to combat a pestilence, there already exists, and we can be sure, and we will see, an assembly, a host, plaguing the land with a doctrine similar, which the John there uses and then embellishes to a dying and rising individual. Not to the extent of where this John will take it, but it's plaguing the land. And to stop it, there must be a counter attack against it of which this John is sent for to do.